Well, welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'm so excited that you are joining us today. Uh, we believe that healthy communication is oxygen for your relationships and your leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one -on -one, to a team from a stage or from behind a screen, we hope uh, this time on the podcast today will challenge you. We hope it will inspire you, encourage you to communicate in healthy ways because we know that when you do, you really will change your world with your words. Well, welcome to another week of our series, How to Tell a Really Good Story. We've been having the best conversations about the art and practice of storytelling, and we've been unraveling some of the secrets behind the art of storytelling. So if you have missed any of uh, the weeks in the series, make sure you head to speakwithpeople.com slash podcast and you can catch up. Well, in this installment, I I'm so excited because we are uh, interviewing just an incredible guest. I'm so excited. We'll tell you more about him uh, in a second, but he's got uh, decades of experience in the storytelling industry. He's helped individuals, organizations around the world craft powerful narratives that resonate with their audiences. I really think he'll have a unique uh, perspective, some insights he's sought after. And I ran into him at a conference and, and I tried not to be the, the annoying fan, but he was so gracious and asked if he'd be on the podcast. And he said, uh, yes. So I, I will let him tell you more about himself, but I'm so excited today to welcome Phil Cook to the Speak With People podcast. Welcome, Phil. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored. That's a great introduction, by the way. And and let me just say, when you say we ran into each other at the conference, I think we literally did run into each other. <laughs> we really so, did. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a good start. It was a good start. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, could you tell us, just, uh, just tell our listeners a little bit about yeah. who you are, your story? That would be great. Yeah, we. I, I'm my wife Kathleen and I launched a company here in Los Angeles called Cook Media Group many many years ago, and um, we've produced programming in about seventy countries around the world. We do. Wow. We've done films. We've done television programs. We've done Super Bowl commercials. We've done all kind of stuff, and um, it's just been a really interesting ride. Now I focus mostly on helping churches, nonprofit organizations, helping them tell their story well. So mm -hmm. we come alongside with them, we consult with them, helping them, wh whatever it happens to be, short videos, podcasting, television, uh, social media, all kind of things. Because I'm going back to your opening comment, which I think uh, is so important that communication is really the heartbeat. Mm. Um, and I, I, I spoke at a conference just last week to a thousand worship leaders at churches and I said that uh, you will never be a great leader until you can become a great communicator. Wow. And I just think that communication wow. really lies at the heart because, you know, you may not speak to, I, I was in Brazil speaking to 7,000 pastors and business leaders just two wow. weeks ago, and you may not speak to that size crowd, yep. but some, at some point you're going to speak to your film crew, your design team, uh, your video guys, whatever you're going to have a team of people around you that you need to communicate well with, and you're going to need right. to inspire and motivate them. So I love what you're doing. And I'm so behind the podcast concept because you're right. Communication is the key to everything. Oh, well, thank you. And even now, I mean, I think about all the Gen Zers who have created, who would have thought 20 years ago that a 15 year old could have a platform with yeah. thousands of people just with their phone. I mean, it's That's communication. Exactly right. Is just so important, and I gotta say, I, I'm I I interviewed lots of folks. I love your backdrop because uh, you know I'm a little bit of an eclectic myself. I love some stuff, and so I love. <laughs> I can see that. I'm already That's looking. Funny. You know, I I, I love yes. what you got going on there. <laughs> Yeah, a few of the little hardware. We, you know, when you're around as long as me, you tend to win a few awards occasionally. You know, what do they say? Even a broken watch can keep time twice a day. So, <laughs> it's um, it's it's we win a few things every once in a while. Hey, I love it. I love it. It's fan absolutely fantastic. Uh, okay, so uh, we've been in this series called How to Tell a Really Good Story because yeah. so often. Uh, I mean, we all know this story is so important. Donald Miller says the human brain longs for story and people just want to be able to tell better stories. And so in each of these weeks of the series, we've been just trying to interview people like yourself who have a different part of the storytelling process. You, you've been going at this for a while, like like you mentioned. Is there a pivotal moment in your career uh, in your story that kind of ignited your passion for storytelling? Uh, I'd love to hear you know, that. That's a great question, actually. I, you know, I, I st I'm so old that I started out with a Super 8 film movie camera. My dad yes. had a Super 8, you, you may remember those, three-minute little film mm -hmm. roll. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't think you could edit. So, But I had two or three buddies from high school, and we would make 
movies. We made a space movie, a mafia movie, an army movie. We just love making these short little three minute films. Mm. And when I, and it never crossed my mind that I could do this for a living. And I went to college thousand miles away. And literally the first day I'm, I'm at college unpacking my suitcases, uh, a couple of my films rolled out of my, my suitcase. I, I thought I'd bring them along. I took my dad's camera. I thought, well, maybe I'll find somebody in college that would like to do this. And a guy literally across the hall, Rod Carlson, I'll never forget his name. He said, look, I, I'm taking a film class and I can show you how to edit your little film. Like I said, I didn't even know you could cut film. So that night, literally, we went down to the film department and we were working for hours, cutting my little film. He was showing me some techniques. And as it got late into the evening, I discovered the professor was there and he had been working on a project of his own in the back room. And as he's leaving, he comes over, introduces himself and said, you know, I've, I've got students that have been taking film classes for two and three years that still don't do this well. He said, yeah. I've been watching your little film out of the corner of my eye. And he said, would you mind if I showed it in our class tomorrow? And I said, well, sure, if I can sit, if I can sit in on the back row. Right. And, and so the next day I, I go to the class, I give him the film, we thread the projector, I sit on the back row. And trust me, it was not a, a, a great movie by any means, but they showed my movie. And at the end of it, the class discussed it. And this thought hit me. I, it may be the most crystal clear moment of revelation I've ever had in my whole life that if I can do something with a camera that makes people talk like this, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. Wow. And I literally changed my major that day and I've never looked back. And I just recognized right away that the power of that camera to tell stories, mm. to impact people's lives. It's just so remarkable. So I, I just started focusing on that. And like I say, I never look back. And here we are after all those years. I love it. So fast forward all these years. Are Do you get excited with how quickly technology has advanced and that, you know, people can be filmmakers with their phones? Do you think it's like yeah. taken away from the art at all? Or is it just it's just all exciting? It's exciting and it's exhausting, to be honest. You know, I, I, when I started out, the, you know, a professional broadcast video camera cost a quarter of a million dollars. Um, today, my my iPhone, like you say, has a better image than that camera did. Wow. And so there are a couple film festivals in the U.S. for feature films shot on iPhones. And so I, I tell people, look, don't wait. When I was young, I had to go find an investor. I had to go find somebody with money or somebody yep. that owned equipment to help me go make a film. Today, you've got this. There's, yep. there's, there's just an amazing amount of things you could do. I, I met a director of photography here in Los Angeles in Hollywood just the other day. A woman who's a brilliant camera operator. She does major projects. All she shoots with is an iPhone. And she's got these amazing handheld rigs and telescopic uh -huh. rigs and things she uses with it. But it's, it just reminded me that there's no reason to complain don't wait. Don't yep. wait for your big break. Don't wait for that. You know, the money don't wait for a opening at the studio. Just start making your movies now, oh, telling your stories now. I love that. I love that. Okay. So hopping into the art of storytelling. So in your experience, yeah. I'd love to know, you know, what for you makes a story truly memorable, impactful. Are there any elements or techniques that for you are like, these are a must. They've got to consistently be, be a part of this. Well, it's interesting. There's a number of things about storytelling that really stand out for me. One of them is I think people that struggle to tell a story well need to start with their own story. And and mm. and, and I, I say, I tell people the, the importance of your origin story really matters. People yeah. want to know how you got started. I like your question, how, Phil, how did you get started in, you know, telling stories and I'm, you know, my whole film class situation. Um, People are fascinated with how you got your start. And yep. so, you know, if you look at the collectible comic book market, you know, Iron Man, Batman, Superman, the really rare collectible comics, the most expensive ones are origin stories. They're how mm. Iron Man got started, how Daredevil got started, or Batman got started. People are just fascinated with origin stories. So I always tell people, start with your origin story. How did you mm. get started? Um, how did you meet your husband, your wife? Um, how did you launch your company? Whatever it is. And, and here's something that fascinates me. And, and that is, I meet people every day that never think of incorporating that story into what they do for a living. Yes. You know, you may sell insurance. You may be a filmmaker. You may be a college coach. Whatever you are, I want to tell you, if you want to be unique and different and stand out from everybody else, 
start incorporating your personal story into what you do. Mm. And that, you know, nobody has your personal story. Nobody has your background, your history, your family. And so yes. you start incorporating that into the work that you're doing. I'm telling you, it's going to immediately put you on the map because it's going to separate you from the pack. Wow. Wow. Uh, I've, I've been a speaker for 20 some years and I share a lot of stories, have just always loved them. And typically what people will say to me is uh, stories about my life. They'll say, I just don't have any stories like you do. And I think you just nailed it. We all do go back and start thinking about those stories in your life. Yes, you may have not have witnessed your best friend's mom vacuuming up their pet bird, which happened to me, <laughs> but um, I guarantee you know, that's so yeah. good. We all, we all have these stories. Um, so yeah. in your, your career, if, if I've gathered right, um, you've worked with kind of this really diverse range, you know, yes. Hollywood studios, nonprofits, churches, businesses. How do you take your storytelling approach to cater, you know, such a different audiences, different purposes? Does it basically just work the same or do you have to approach, mm -hmm. you know, each one a little differently? Not at all. Actually, I think there are, obviously there's some overriding principles, but one of the key things that's important to me is how you tell a story is just as important as the story you tell. Mm. So for one thing, that means you've got to, if, if you're going to be a filmmaker, you can't just have a great story. You've got to be a great filmmaker. If you're going to really do something spectacular, um, you've got to be a great writer. If you're going to be a speaker, you've got to really practice and practice and practice and be an ex be an, you know, extraordinarily speak, uh, be an extraordinary speaker. Mm. I just think that how, you know, the way you tell the story is just every bit as important as the story you tell. So number one, be really good at how you do it, how you tell it, whatever medium that might be, whatever format it might be in the same mm. way with what I do with different clients. My church audience might be different than a Hollywood studio audience, which is different than a business audience. It's different from a Super Bowl audience. So I have to constantly be thinking about how do I tell this story in the unique way that I, I'm challenged to here? How, who's the audience? What's the, the platform I have? What is the equipment and the tools that I have? If you think about those things, suddenly those things will all start coming together in a different way. Because as you know, how many times you've read a book and then went to see the movie and the movie wasn't nearly as good right. as the book. Right. Uh, occasionally it's better. Um, but every, you know, how you tell it, every platform you tell it on, it, it changes the story. And so it's really important to remember that a story is not just in isolation. How you tell it really does matter. Mm. Boy, that's so good. So when it comes to storytelling, I mean, it, it feels like people have always craved authenticity, uh, but yeah. you know, how, how important is authenticity when you're telling a story, when you're trying to connect with audiences, especially, you know, in, in, in film, in yeah. video, you know, how, how can you bring that authenticity alive so they can feel yeah. that? Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, that, that, that's so true. I kind of use the word reality even more than authenticity because I want my mm. stories to be real. I want them to be real. Um, I think people can spot a fake a mile away, particularly younger people today who are the most marketed to sold pitch generation in history. Yes. They can spot a con a mile away. So we have to be terribly, terribly real. And we have a, we, for the Christians that are listening or watching, I have to say that we have a saying in Hollywood that, Hollywood is great at making fake things look real, but Christians are great at making real things look fake. And it's, it's sad. It's very sad. But when you think about it, you see Christian movies or yep. Christian television programs. They're not being, you know, most of them are a little bit on the cheesy side, a little bit on the corny side. Yep. They're a little bit, you know, they're not, they're <clears throat> not real authentic stories. And so I just think that, um, telling the story the way it should be told. Obviously you can leave out gratuitous violence or sex or, you know, things like yeah. that. However, I wrote my PhD, my doctoral dissertation on the movie, the Shawshank Redemption. Wow. And here you had everything negative in that movie. You had prison, you had homosexual rape, you had vast amounts of violence and obscenities. And, and yet it was such an incredibly powerful story mm. because it was, it felt real. It was, that it was done so well that uh, it was a it was a powerful movie so reality authenticity you're right it's incredibly important mm, so good go go with me back for a second because you said something really profound there isn't it interesting how these younger generations they really can spot a con or oh yeah the in the inauthentic person i mean it's amazing how quickly why why do you think is it the advancement of technology is it 
you know, because of how much they've been marketed to? I mean, do you think it's all those kind of things it's a, combined? I think it's all of the above, probably. I do yeah. think that, remember, they're the first, the, the youngest ones out there, the first generation that's really been, had iPhones, computers, the digital world their whole life. Um, most of us, you know, lived a significant part of our life before we got introduced to a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And so they've lived that way all the time. And one British study indicates that the typical person today sees about 10,000 media messages every single day. And so we're literally being overwhelmed with advertisements and promotions and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And I, and I also saw a study recently that we touch our phones, um, an average of 247 times a day. So in that world wow. they're getting so much input you know we grew up with a with a myth actually remember when we were in school and we were taught that we only use 10 percent of our brain right well that's a that's a total myth i mean we're literally being overtaxed because our brains are just being overwhelmed with the sheer amount of information that's flooding toward us every single day so yeah. i think that generation has just grown up with that and yep. they've gotten a lot better at discerning the real from the fake uh, than we ever were. So it's a, it's a combination of things. Technology probably doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. <clears throat> you think about, you, you mentioned the brain kind of thing. I'm, I'm remembering the movie yeah. uh, Limitless. I don't know if you saw yes. the movie. Yeah. Where mm -hmm. he takes that pill, you know, and it like, it, you know, gets the other part of his brain um, working uh, c kind of, you know, uh, going off of that. I just saw an interview with Steve Cook recently and he talked about how when they created the iPhone, they never wanted to be something that you spend all your time with. And so he he oh. said for his, his goal now is to look people in the eye as much as he's looking at a screen. And I yeah. thought, wow, that's powerful. How do we get that to the younger generation? Yeah. You, you know, know, it has the, to be it has to be intentional, though. It has to yeah. be really intentional. I, I go to restaurants all the time and I'm on the road an enormous amount and I'll be in a restaurant and you just see kids sitting there trying to talk to their parents and their parents are glued to their iPhone. They're just sitting yep. there on their iPhone all the time. And trust me, kids sense that they get yep. the fact that that phone is more important than they are. Yep. And, um, I just think it's really destroying relationships. I try to keep my phone in my pocket. I know there's, there's a movement of people that I know, creative people, they're going back to flip phones <laughs> and, um, they're trying to get away from all the, yep. you know, the iPhone stuff and just get back to using it for a phone. And so there, it's just interesting the way people deal with it, but it does have to be intentional. It will be hard, but I do, I really would like to see us get a grasp on um, being able to put it down yeah. occasionally. Absolutely. Because I think it'll make a difference. Yeah. Do you ever, uh, as you watch somebody edit, you know, super quickly <clears throat> on, a, on an iPhone, do you, oh. do you ever go back in time when you're, you know, editing, you know, actual film and all that and, and you're just like oh. ah. <laughs> it, it was agonizing it was painful yeah I, it's just amazing <laughs> i i i was talking to a guy the other day that makes you know short little instagram and TikTok videos and he just shoots them and edits them right there while he's standing there and i'm yep. thinking how oh, i could have never there was no way so in fact when i started in television and we were editing a network television special it took four people in the editing room just to operate the equipment so um, things have changed dramatically over the years and, and probably in that respect, it's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So uh, many aspiring storytellers, sometimes they, they kind of struggle to find their unique voice, you know? Yeah. Uh, what, what's their own, you know, play on it? Well, any advice you would give to people who are, you know, they're, they're trying to like lean in to kind of find their voice in the storytelling instead of just kind of copying everyone else's any any thoughts for those folks yeah absolutely you know the great sculptor michelangelo someone asked him one time how he carved such great statues and he thought for a moment and he said you know i really don't carve statues i just remove the excess stone so the angel inside can come out and i tell wow. people that are filmmakers or storytellers or creative people it's not about becoming something that you aren't mm -hmm. it's about getting removing all that extra junk and getting down to who you really are. What are your passions? What are you most passionate about? I wrote a book called One Big Thing, Discovering What You Were Born to Do, because I met so many people that have lived their entire life and never really understood what they were put on the earth to accomplish. Mm. And I think figuring that out, understanding what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, 
Um, in, in the book, I talk about, you remember at the high school prom, if you were on the planning committee, we sat around a table and somebody would say, Bob, you know, you're, you're great in front of people. Why don't you host? And Susan, you're good with numbers. Why don't you do the budget? And Sam, you're really creative. Why don't you do the advertising, the promotion? Other people notice what we're good at. And sometimes we don't. So take that time to sit back and find out what makes you different from everybody else that you know. Mm. What, what do you do? You know, what do you do that comes fairly easy for you? Even though you work at it, it comes easier to you than it does for most other people. Those kind of things will start to give you an indication of what, what your great strengths are, what makes you unique and different. And I think that's really, really critical. And let me just say real quick that it's really, I find in Hollywood, it's about the niche. You know, our British friends say niche. Uh, it's about the niche. It's not a trick. You know, I tell young filmmakers, don't come to Hollywood and to be a director because mm. then you're competing against Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese and all these other major James Cameron, major directors. Think in terms of what kind of maybe I could be the best director at a certain kind of budget, certain kind of a genre, certain type of schedule. What are the kind of films I have friends that became extraordinary at doing horror films mm. and they got so good at it. They eventually broke out and became able to do anything they wanted, or they got really good at a certain type of comedy. They really focus. Don't try to be all things to everybody because start in that narrow niche, become the best in the world with that little niche. And then no telling where you can go from there. Wow. That is, that is so good. That is so good. Uh, I'm sorry. It was a mouthful. I didn't mean to explain no. so much. I apologize. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I, I, I wrote uh, a ton of those notes down. That was absolutely fantastic because you're right. I mean, we're, we're, we kind of live in a copycat culture now. And so yeah. it's so great when we can kind of, and it's great to learn from other people, but you know, to be able to do that, uh, you know, storytelling is obviously just not words. I mean, for the speaker, it's not just words for video, you know, if a videographer, it's not just words, it's visual sound, body language. How can speakers or, uh, you know, uh, videographers kind of use all of those, all of those elements in a story? Cause I think sometimes people, I, I see this a lot in churches for sure. You know, the, the pastor is up front telling a story and, and they leave out images and they leave out props and they leave out you know, any bit of creative items that could bring the story alive. I'm not sure why they do that, but any advice to, you know, uh, storytellers that want to bring the whole story alive and how to use all those other mediums. That's a great point. And I, I would, I would say this when you're starting out, don't look for props. Mm. When you're starting out, become a great storyteller first. I, I think that's a really good piece of advice. I, I know people that uh, they, they decide they want a speaking career. They start speaking and they immediately go to PowerPoint. They immediately use other techniques and tools and yep. they suddenly yep. start using those as a crutch and yep. they never took the time to become a great speaker first. Mm -hmm. So I would say number one, that's good. become amazing at just speaking all by yourself. Yep. Let, let's start there. Then once you're really comfortable with that, once you're really compelling, then start looking for other ways to enhance that story. I love PowerPoint or key to Apple keynote. I love being able to, cause stories need to be visual. Yep. Um, it was funny. I sat on a plane next to a guy. He looked like Dwight Schrute from the office the other day. <laughs> and he's he was working on a PowerPoint on his laptop and I couldn't help but lean over. And I saw that his, his slides were word for word, wall to wall, no photos, mm. no graphics, just text, solid slides full of text, just yep. single space text. It was horrible. And I leaned over to him and I, I, sometimes I can't help myself, but I leaned over and just said, have you ever considered using graphics or photographs, you know, to help enhance that? Yes. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. And he said, no, I'm a professional. I would never do that. <laughs> and I thought, what a moron. He has no clue about how to make that a compelling story. You know, if you yep. have that much text, print it out in a brochure and hand it out to yep. people. Um, use your slides and your supplementary music or whatever you're doing as a support for mm. you telling that story. And, uh, but I, I agree with you hundred percent film clips, video clips, still photos, music, sound effects, whatever you can use to enhance the story. Now I would say that, let me go third would yeah. be, but don't clutter it up, mm. you know, take it to a point where you're telling the story without cluttering it up. Sometimes we get, we want to bring so much to the table yep. that it, it really obscures the, the heart of the story and makes yep. it 
actually more difficult. So I like keeping stories straight, clean, direct, getting to the point so and not cluttering them up. So there's a happy medium in there, but it's a so great, great point. Or practice using your prop first. I was speaking last year oh. and I used a, a, a you know, a life-size mirror and I was illustrating how words can't, you know, what words do to kind of your soul. And so the mirror, I, I smothered black paint all over it. And then I, I, I took a baseball and I thought, okay, I'm going to throw this ball at the mirror and it will shatter. And it'll be this great big, you know, point made. And <laughs> turns out I bought the mirror that is unshatterable. So the baseball <laughs> just bounced off of it and everyone just stood there. I'm like, so what you said there is just brilliant. Like be really great at, at just telling the story first. Like, uh, yeah, I, I love that. I, I love that. Yeah, um, there's, there's a there's a book out there just quick, a book yeah. out there called Tell Your Tell Your Story, Change the World. And the whole premise of the book is don't rely on PowerPoint. Don't rely on keynotes so soon. Mm -hmm. Become a great speaker first, then move on to those other tools and they can be fantastic. It's so good. It's so true. I love that. So I know you've worked on tons of projects. Has there been one? You know, I mean, it's probably been multiple ones, but one that sticks out that you've, you know, it was just uh, obstacle after obstacle. And then in the midst of it, you had to kind of create this like, you know, compelling narrative and story. And you, you wondered if, if it was ever going to work out. And then the, you know, final <laughs> finished product was like better than you ever anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we do a lot of documentaries and okay. documentaries, you really can't write ahead of time. You kind of get an idea of what you want to do and where you want to go with it. But since you're interviewing a lot of people, you have no idea what they're going to say ultimately. So you kind of write documentaries in the edit room. Mm. So even though, you know, I want to have a handle in my head of what I'm trying to do. We did a documentary on the rise of Christianity in Asia, the unexpected rise of Christianity and how huge wow. it was. But long before it came to Europe, it was unbelievable in the East. And uh, we filmed in India, China, Mongolia, South Korea, Japan. Uh, we were all over the place. Wow. And um, we were trying to weave a ton of stories and a ton of history into a, into a one-hour documentary. And um, it, was, it was a real challenge. It was a television special we did. And it was a super challenge. But I, you start learning to start telling the story as you go. Mm. And... Um, I just, I love, I love that. I love the, uh, cause you get to places where people will say things you didn't expect. They'll say things that you weren't planning on and it could veer the story off in a different direction. So the way I would answer that is just to say, look, always as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, as a writer, always be open to the story going in a different direction mm. because what we think in our head it ought to be. And this has happened to me so many times. Um, what, what I started out to do isn't exactly how I finished up because mm. some, something happened. Uh, some, some person I interviewed or a circumstance or whatever during the production veered it off in a different direction. It took it to a much better place that I'd never expected. So to do that, you have to be open to that and not so locked into the story in your head or the idea in your head or the outline in your head that you're not capable of really changing things up. Ooh. That's so good. That's so good. Kind of as we finish up here, boy, there are times sure. just like flew by and I'm sure I could, you know, ask you like it's 15 fun. other other questions. But any, uh, you know, uh, actionable tips you'd leave our listeners as they're trying to master the art of storytelling, as they're trying. To, I, I, I know you've given us such good, you know, wisdom and some some really rich action steps already. But anything as we've kind of gone through, you know, that you absolutely would kind of leave with our storytellers. Yeah. Let me give you three things real quick. I call them the Holy Trinity of creativity. One is find the place. The other is find the time. And the third is show up, you know, find the place. Everybody has a place where we can be most productive. I've written in 120 degree heat at the base of the pyramids. I've written on a freighter chugging up the Amazon river. I've written uh, in a, in, in a Ugandan hotel room where I could hear bullets firing outside the window during a military coup. However, the best place in the world for me to write is my home office. I've got my mm. tools. I've got my books. I've got my library. Everything I need is there. So that's the place I want to do my intense creative mm. stuff. Then find the, the, the time. You know, we all live with circadian rhythm and we don't pay enough attention to that. I'm a morning person. I discovered early on that from 6 a.m. to noon, man, I can write like a wild man. I can be in, intensely creative. Yep. After lunch, forget it. I can do interviews. I can travel. I can speak. 
but intense creative work, I've got to do it in the morning. Other yeah. people keep rock star hours, like to do it late at night. And there's a sliver of people I don't understand that are there be- at their best right after lunch in the afternoon. I'm with you. Um, <laughs> but figure it out. Figure yeah. it out and protect that time as much as possible because you're going to do far better work in an hour or two during your best time mm. than you will in five or six hours at your worst time. And then the final thing is show up. Somebody told me that there's a great quote out there that the art of writing is the art of connecting your, the seat of your pants to the seat of a chair. And I think Ooh. it's really true. We, we want to call ourselves, ourselves storytellers or graphic designers or filmmakers or writers. But if that's true, you need to be doing it every day. Mm. Every day. We need to take it seriously. When I was in college, I dated a, a girl who wanted to be a concert pianist. She practiced four hours every single day, no matter what she would practice four hours every day. Now it ruined our, you know, romantic life, but boy, was she an Hmm. amazing pianist and she, she achieved her goal. So I just think that we have to consider if we're going to do this, look at ourselves like a professional and find the right place where you can do your best work. Uh, A lot of research indicates a custom design workplace is far more creative than a workplace designed by somebody else. Hmm. Um, Figure out the time of day to be there. Yep. And then finally show up every day and do great work. And that'll, that. that is what will really open the floodgates for your creativity. I love that. I love that. Well, hey, before I let you go, uh, let me ask you just a few rapid fire questions. Our listeners can kind of keep uh, getting to know you. Uh, and uh, these are kind of fun because we learn a lot, you know, uh, through these. So they, they may uh, be fun for you. They may be fun for you, but they're terrifying for me. <laughs> let me just say that. I love it. Well, do you have a favorite speaker uh, when it comes to, you know, boy, this every time you listen to the speaker, you're just they they cause you to lean in. You're blown away by them. I have four or five of them. Erwin McManus, pastor of Mosaic Church here in Hollywood, is Absolutely. one of those guys. I think Erwin is a master storyteller, and I think he's an extraordinary communicator. Um, yes. Early on in my career, I was a big fan of John Maxwell. Um, I, I, I just think he did some things for leadership out there that were just remarkable. And and I've gotten to speak with him at a couple events, and it's just a magnificent thing. Um, so I, I have to think of some others. There are others that I, I, I love listening to, and I think they're – for a lot of different reasons, I go with different kind of speakers, but, but, um, those would be two right off the top of my head. I love it. I love it. Do you have an absolute favorite movie? One that you can just, you know, I, I get asked that all the time and I actually, I'm embarrassed to say I don't, but there's a wide range, like everything from the Godfather yep. to, um, Shawshank Redemption, like I mentioned earlier. Um, all, but there's a lot of classic movies like Citizen Kane. I'm a big fan of. And so I don't know. I'm all over the map. I just love movies and yep. um, I'll, I'm all over the map. And, you know, and I have this one area in my life where I just need to see something explode. So I'm a James Bond fan, you know, big <laughs> action movies. There's sometimes as a guy, you just see the yes, need something shot. And so yep. I, I, that's fun, too. So I like a, a wide range of them. Well, this weekend I saw Equalizer 3 with Denzel Washington. And oh, my goodness, it was it was it was incredible. Okay, <laughs> last rapid fire question: uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite location that you've you know shot a movie you know a project on? Um, you know, it was interesting. Early in my career, I was asked to film do a documentary on a, a medical team at the headwaters of the Amazon. We flew into Manaus, which is a big city halfway up the Amazon River. Took a light plane four hours deeper into the jungle. Landed on a dirt strip. Then we took a freighter, big old freighter up two more days up the Amazon and then spent the final day uh, final day in traveling by canoe. Mm. We got to a village that was so remote. They had rarely seen, um, any, you know, a white person at all. Wow. And th- I was there a month. We were there filming for a month complete. This is before cell phones and uh, had a nuclear bomb going off and, and somewhere else in the world. I would have never known. We were wow. so, so deep into the Amazon, just at the headwaters. And that was just a profound experience for me uh, being that far away from anything I'd known before. And um, I'll I'll never forget that. And and, and it's maybe that was what has burned in me, this desire to travel. I, Hmm. I, like I say, we filmed in 70 countries, but I've traveled in many, many more. I was in Brazil for 10 days last week, and now I'm going to India for 10 days next week. 
and um, I'm just on the road all the time, and I absolutely adore it. I just absolutely love it. I've, I've, I told my wife I will probably die in an obscure, cheap hotel room somewhere in some weird part of the world, but that's the way it is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Phil, I can't thank you for this time. I mean, this has just been so. Uh, it's been fun. I know it's going to help. Uh, you know, many, many people. Uh, kind of point us to you know where we should find out more about you online. Sure. PhilCook.com. I'm Cook with an E. P-H-I-L-C-O-O-K-E.com is my blog and kind of the center for everything. Our company is CookMediaGroup.com. But uh, my blog is where it's at, where you can get my books, uh, connect with my podcast. Um, that's kind of the home base for everything I do. PhilCook.com. Thanks for asking. Absolutely. And we'll uh, definitely put all that stuff in the show notes. And I'll put a link. Typically what we do is we get uh, books of our guests and then we do oh, giveaways. We have a Facebook group, and so we'll we'll give them away in there. And I had um, I had gotten your book, Ideas on a Deadline, after I heard you speak back in uh, the summer when we were at the yeah. NRB, and uh, I, I passed it on to a friend. So uh, I will I will have some I'll, to be able to I'll, give. I'll send you some more. I'll That'd send be amazing. You some more, no problem. I would absolutely love it. Thank you again for your time, and so appreciate it. Been great. Thank you. And thank you, uh, listeners, for joining us uh, at the Speak With People podcast. We're so excited that you have taken this time. By the way, don't forget, uh, we have a Facebook group with hundreds of leaders from around the country who are all working hard to elevate the importance and practice of healthy communication in our lives. Just go to Facebook, search Speak With People, and you'll find the Facebook group. Thanks again. Hope today you've been challenged, encouraged to elevate the importance and practice of healthy communication in your life and leadership. And my hope is, is that you will use that to speak with people and not at them. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much.